Program's Winter Webinar Series. I'm so happy you're able to join us today for this uh, last of our four webinar series on Tools in the Toolbox for Private Land Conservation. And just as people are joining us, it's always interesting to see who's out there. So we have a couple of polls for you to complete to find out who is with us today. So the first one is to find out uh, where people are from. So uh, which part of the Kootenays or elsewhere in BC or potentially outside BC. So if you'd like to go ahead and let us know where you're from, we'll uh, share the results in just a moment. We're neck and neck with the West Kootenai and others in BC. Oh, more joining from the East Kootenai. We have 92% of people who voted. So I'm going to show you those results. 96% voted. Is anybody else wanting to represent their geography in the next few seconds? All right, we'll close that poll and share it with you. So we've got most of the folks uh, in the Kootenays from the West Kootenay, but about half of the folks are from the Kootenays, 40% elsewhere in BC and 8% outside BC. So that's really interesting. Um, and we'll do one more poll as we're letting people get to uh, join us. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I have to play with these poll buttons. And the next one is, where? Uh, what's your perspective? Where are you coming from in terms of what organization you work for or your perspective? So we've got, uh, if you're a landowner, stewardship group, coming from local or provincial or federal government, student, teacher, or educator, or a consultant. Unfortunately, it only gives us five options, so we've lumped a few there. So interestingly, about a third, uh, tw a quarter government, third stewardship group so far. Let's see if anybody else has to vote. Maybe some of you don't quite fit into a category, so choose the most relevant one, I suppose. And we'll share that with you. So about a third from stewardship groups, a third consultants, 22% uh, from government, and uh, the remainders students, teachers, educators, or landowners, which is really interesting. Great. Well, thank you for wherever you are sitting and whatever perspective you're, you're from. I'm glad you were able to join us today. Uh, the Kootenai Conservation Program is a partnership of over 80 different organizations in the Kootenai region in southern, southeastern BC, all working on conservation. And we really appreciate the support uh, from our funders who are listed here, without whom we couldn't do programs like this. Today, we'll have a, the webinar will be about 45 minutes, with up to 15 minutes for questions at the end. But Lynn is happy to answer questions during the, the uh, talk. You are on mute, so you won't be asking questions verbally, but instead put them into your questions box feature on your dashboard there. And we'll be monitoring those throughout the presentation and uh, be able to ask Lynn those on your behalf. And the webinar will be recorded and be available on our kootenayconservation.ca website. So if there's anyone you know that would have liked to be here today and couldn't make it, please let them know that they can find the webinar there. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lynn Campbell. She's a species at risk biologist with the Ministry of Environment in BC. And she'll be talking today on species at risk on private land. She's been uh, coordinating the species and ecosystems at risk local government working group in BC, and also really promoting public input into species at risk on private land. And this has been a topic that's come up from our partners, not numerous partners, so we're really excited and Thankful that you could be here today, Lynn, to share your information. I'm going to hand the reins over to you now. Great. 
hopefully. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I can. You can. I can't hear from anybody else. Okay. <laughs> Assuming others can. Uh, <laughs> I have to get my dashboard. Okay, so um, thanks so much for inviting me to speak today, Juliet, and um, thanks to everybody for your interest in joining us today. Um, as Juliet said, I am very happy for questions interrupt me as we go along. Um, and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions as we go as best I can. And then we could have a discussion at the end um, you know, for the questions if there's time and uh, interest. So um, yes, today I'm going to be uh, talking about management of species and ecosystems at risk here in BC. And um, as Joanne said, my name is Lynn Campbell and I'm from the Ecosystems Branch of BC Ministry of Environment and I'm based in Victoria. So today I'm going to be um, talking about SEER. Uh, it's an acronym for Species and Ecosystems at Risk. I will be saying SEER instead of um, the full name um, throughout the presentation. Um, so I'm going to be giving a bit of an overview about SEER in BC. Um, and then I'm going to talk specifically about the group that Juliet mentioned, the SEER Local Government Working Group. So first of all, I just wanted to give a broader sort of um, explanation about how the province uh, approaches management of SEER in BC. First of all, we have something called the Accord and the Canada-BC Agreement on Species at Risk, otherwise known as the Bilateral. So that's agreements between the federal government and BC. We have a number of different statutes that we use. Uh, there's information uh, through the Conservation Data Center. Specifically, hopefully, some of you are aware of this website. It's called the BC Species and Ecosystems Explorer. Uh, it's a great site if you wanted to look up. You can just put a species name in here, and it gives you a bunch of information and reports. And um, for a lot of species, there's even map data. We provide support for recovery planning. And here's the website. There's a lot of recovery plans that are on there and a bunch of information. The URL at the bottom is very long, so I recommend just Googling recovery planning in BC, and you'll probably get to it a little bit faster. And we provide support for search of efforts on private lands, which is going to be um, the main focus of what I'm going to be talking about today. So hopefully you guys have maybe heard of something called uh, the five-year plan for species at risk. This was a key initiative that the provincial government launched in 2014. And it identifies a series of actions to help improve and manage SEER in BC. And there are three key actions which are really aimed at specifically strengthening the provincial protection of species at risk. Um, and they also require further public input. So the first one is about identifying opportunities to address gaps. Um, in protection, including consulting the public and stakeholders before there's any changes. And the second one's about promoting voluntary stewardship, um, and that's coming up with potentially innovative ideas for incentives and possible project funding, all related with uh, private land in mind. And the third one's about identifying innovative funding mechanisms, um, which could possibly include things like inventory monitoring and research. So one way that the province uh, was working to seek public input was through this website, which maybe some of you had a chance to participate in, which was the Species at Risk Public Engagement site. And it was live from October 19th to November 30th um, last year. So specifics, we're, we're still working on um, analyzing some of the responses to that engagement. Uh, but here's a table you can see about some of the questions and the outcomes. Um, there was actually a fairly high number of visits to the site, especially for something that was a fairly short um, time frame and a fairly specific topic. Um, and there were four different topics of questions asked. And topic three, you can see, is specifically about protection on private land. So let's just look at that a little bit in more detail. So we asked, what motivates you to protect species risk where you live? And please provide examples of effective monetary and non-monetary incentives that the province might consider. So some of the things we heard back were that respondents stated that they really appreciated uh, the natural world and its intrinsic value, um, and it's their primary motivation for striving to protect species at risk. 
that they developed a greater awareness through education and communities as a way to um, rally voluntary support. Um, that there was support for government programs that would subsidize habitat restoration, improvements and protections on private lands through tax breaks and grants. That folks were wary of imposition and loss of control, uh, changing regulations and layers of red tape for protecting species risk on their own property. But also that species risk should be protected regardless of whether their habitat is on private land, uh, public land, or treaty land. So it sort of gives you the sort of gamut of the sort of re uh, some of the responses we received. So let's look back again at the species risk five-year plan, specifically um, my very jiggly highlighted section here that talks about um, some of the actions that are necessary to promote the shared stewardship approach. And this one relates to engaging all local governments, including municipalities and regional districts, uh, conservation partners, stewardship groups, First Nations, and others in efforts to manage and protect species at risk, which is an ongoing task. And specifically in the five-year plan, we note the work of the Sierra Local Government Working Group. We do have a website if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. Um, again, it's probably easier to just Google the long eight-letter acronym <laughs> name rather than searching for the URL um, uh, or typing in the URL. But I do um, recommend that you go and have a look through the website. Um, there's a bunch of information, including the terms of reference for the group. Um, and some other information that I'll talk about in a sec. So why species risk on private land? Well, we know that about less than 5% of BC is, is private land. However, there's a really high proportion of species risk that occur on private land. We also know that there have been public opinion polls done, quite a few in the past, and pretty much all of them suggest strong public support for protection of species risk on private land. And then my little pie chart on the side here just shows some um, really crude analysis we did a few years ago um, that emphasizes that a lot of species at risk don't, there are some wide ranging species, but a lot of them tend to occur in fairly localized areas, showing the importance of that habitat protection for a particular site. Well, we also know species at risk like valley bottoms, and they also like coastal areas. And people tend to like valley bottoms and coastal areas, so we have a little bit of a conflict. I did a little bit of geospatial analysis with some, uh, some initial findings here that I wanted to share with you just to sort of cement that whole idea that um, species at risk and, and uh, private land. So of the known occurrences, 87% of species at risk known occurrences are on private land. When you remove the wide range, a couple of the wide ranging species, you still left with 65% on private land. So it shows how important private land is for species risk conservation. And specifically, when you look at 15% um, of species at risk on private lands are actually on private agricultural land reserves. So agriculture is also a really key component. So I just want to take a little trip over to the UK. Uh, you're probably wondering why, but if you guys remember way back to 1992 and the Rio summit, um, the UK was one of the signatories of the Convention on Biological Diversity, and they created something called the UK Biodiversity Action Plan. And Scotland got involved through a group called Scottish Natural Heritage, um, sort of akin to their Ministry of Environment. And the Scottish Biodiversity Forum was formed. Now, I was actually one of um, the biodiversity coordinators that worked in local government there, and I worked in a tiny little county with Cook Manager, uh, and I was a biodiversity coordinator, and we put together a biodiversity action plan. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, I think it's always nice to see um, other examples from around the world, but it's important, I think, to look at a model that worked, I think, quite well for um, biodiversity officers would meet a couple times a year, and they would uh, share lessons learned and experiences, um, and they would have regular teleconferences. Um, and it was a really good networking opportunity and support uh, for, for, for furthering work in our local government areas um, on biodiversity in general and writing plans and working with landowners and stuff. So uh, I came back to British Columbia and um, working at a provincial level, there wasn't really a, a, a organized way um, across the whole province of, of meeting and talking. So. Um, in uh, 2009, the Sierra Local Government Working Group was formed. I formed it 
um, mostly with the idea of creating this network of dialogue and um, fostering communications between the province and local governments. Um, and it includes regional districts and municipalities, and there's over 160 people participating on the group now from all over the province. And the focus of the group is looking at uh, private lands and local government lands, which are my son in Oak Bay, um, also in Park. So progress to date, um, the arrow shows on the website that um, the, one of the first things that the group did together was to create a discussion paper. Um, and uh, it's available, you can get it on the website to have a look. And the discussion paper talks about five key strategies. Um, so I'll just read through them quickly. Uh, the first one is looking at increasing local government awareness of species at risk. There tends to be um, a really wide-ranging um, understanding uh, of species at risk in local government. Some have really high capacity and understanding and background, and others are fairly new to it. Um, another one is, uh, number two, is facilitating use of effective tools and techniques. Um, sometimes people aren't even aware of what exists. Uh, number three is identifying and collaborating on shared responsibilities. Number four is conducting ecosystem mapping and, in and uh, encouraging data sharing. And the fifth one is engaging landowners in species at risk habitat protection. Um, and then this is just the front cover of it. Uh, before our covers uh, weren't, there, there weren't very many pictures on those, but it is, it is an, a good read, I think. It's worthwhile uh, reading through. So, are there any questions so far? I just wanted to stop. All good? Okay. Um, so I just wanted to talk about uh, the progress that the group has done to date. So here's a picture of the group at um, a recent uh, symposium we just had in Victoria on the 31st of January and the 1st of February. We had a really good turnout. There was um, about 70 people. We've uh, had other workshops in the past. Um, I'm losing count now, maybe about four. Um, uh, and people come from all over the province. And workshop reports are on the website if you want. We've done a northern scoping exercise to um, engage with the local governments in the north. There's more symposium reports available. Um, the one before this last one was in October 2013 at a Richmond. Um, and I just wanted to talk again about the last one we just had. Um, part of what part of what the group um, focused on was uh, for the first time ever we announced peer nominated awards for uh, local government. So um, people could be nominated by anybody that participates on the local government working group, um, and that could be staff or elected officials from local government, um, key NGOs that do work with local governments regularly and uh, the provincial government. And we have a few federal government um, observers as well. So anybody could nominate a local government for uh, demonstrating uh, greatness to do with species at risk. And the, the theme for the symposium and the award this year was conservation without borders. So it's sort of uh, fostering and encouraging uh, working across geographical and administrative boundaries. So we were lucky to have the mayor of Victoria, Lisa Help, came and she handed out the awards. And uh, the picture there is of Gerald Christie, who accepted on behalf of um, the Regional District of East Kootenays, uh, who won for your area. So we, what we did is we divided the province into the six areas that we tend to focus on for the local government working group. And the Kootenays is one of them. So uh, Juliet actually nominated um, the regional district, and they, they they weren't able to attend the symposium, but Jill Christie attending from the Columbia Shusaw Regional District was able to accept the award on their behalf. So um, that was really, I think, a, a great, it shows sort of the strength of the group and how long we've been working together. So it's a high time that we were able to acknowledge and celebrate other successes. A couple of questions have come in, Lynn. Oh, great, sure. Uh, one is, uh, how many participants are you getting from the East and West Kootenai? On, on the local government working group? Yes, I think, and the workshops and, and activities. Yeah. yeah, okay, so um, I'd have to double check the total numbers. So there's pretty much all the regional districts have been represented. Um, there are some municipalities. We could probably have a little bit more municipality involvement from the Kootenais. Um, and I always, 
uh, attempt to ask my colleagues from Flynn Row, the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, for their regional staff because the Ministry of Environment doesn't have regional staff. Um, so we ask for Flynn Row regional staff to be involved. So we do have that from the Kootenays as well. Uh, Lindsay Anderson is our contact. Um, and um, in terms of participation, uh, we have had usually at least one or two folks that tend to uh, attend. It is further um, further to come if we have it over in the West Coast. Um, there has been a lot of talk, and for years we've been talking about having another face-to-face -face meeting somewhere more central like the Okanagan. So that would um, probably help with uh, people attending from the Kootenays. So Great. Hopefully that will be able to work. Yeah. Great. And another question, what resources is the province proposing to engage landowners in managing species at risk? For example, incentives, tax breaks, covenants. If you're, if you're coming to that later, we can leave that question. Yeah, I will touch on it. Um, all I can say, it is early days. We, we meaning the province, um, does, they, we, you know, I, I do realize that there needs to be um, some support. Uh, so we have been doing some background work, which I'll talk about in a little while. So I won't be able to announce giant pots of money today, unfortunately, but um, I can tell you about some of the work we're doing in the meantime. Great. Another question, enforcement of provincial regulations. The majority of infractions occur on Crown foreshore. There seems to be a lack of provincial enforcement staff and also an understanding by enforcement staff of where their jurisdiction is on private land. For example, the Water Act. Yeah, the Water Act um, and the new Water Sustainability Act. And I'm not an expert in the new piece of legislation. Um, in terms of enforcement, yes, enforcement, um, getting enough money to, to um, support the conservation office service is really key. Um, I tend to not focus on the Crown land part of things, and usually that tends to be more of uh, my colleagues in Flynn Row. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I I, can pro I can't probably answer further than that. Mm -hmm. These are tough questions. I know, Simon, with you early. Um, and the last question that I see here is I want to know what you mean by shared responsibility. Oh, okay. So um, if you look towards the federal government Species at Risk Act, um, that we tend to be, the province tends to be on the same page as the federal government in terms of the approach we want to take and in, in managing at risk. So um, if you think about it from a sort of high moral perspective, it's that um, uh, maintaining biodiversity and uh, species at risk all within that for the greater good. So um, what, what we're meaning by shared stewardship approach is that it's not up to one individual, nor is it up to one organization to try and uh, provide protection um, and uh, manage species at risk in BC. So it's sort of a all for one kind of uh, team approach is what I meant. Great, thank you, Lynn. That's all the questions at this point. Okay, great questions, everybody. Keep them coming. I'll, um, I'll just continue on. So I wanted to talk a little bit further about the discussion paper I mentioned earlier. Um, the discussion paper is meant to be a live document. It's not supposed to, hopefully not, collect dust sitting on a shelf somewhere. Um, the document contains 45 recommendations that fall under those five key actions I mentioned earlier, or I mean five key strategies. So um, the 45 recommendations fall to three different types of organization. Um, majority, 23 of them fall to the provincial government. Um, the remaining 12 uh, fall, 12 and 10, so there's 12 that go to, level, to local governments and another 10 that go to UBCM, the Union of British Columbia Municipalities. So those recommendations, those total 45 recommendations, were written from the local government perspective. Um, and I say that because um, you'll see if you, read, if you read the discussion paper, some of the wording of the recommendations is just quite strong. And um, so uh, you can see that it is written from that local government perspective. So in order to make sure that the document stays as a live document um, a discussion paper, we uh, I asked um, the local government uh, to try and provide input as to which of the 12 recommendations that were directed to them that uh, they were feeling like they were getting some traction on or that they were referred to and um, there was, um, uh, you know, they were achieving some of those recommendations. Um, and I tried a various different approaches, um, including emailing out spreadsheets and things, and um, I wasn't getting a huge response. So when I asked local governments at the 2013 symposium how it would 
how we could enhance um, some of the responses. Um, people suggested a survey. So I put together um, two different surveys, one from local government and another one for the provincial government. So um, for, the, for the 12 recommendations that were for the local government, um, I asked, it was a three-part question for each of the 12 recommendations. So those th three parts were what's already been achieved or is ongoing in your jurisdiction related to that recommendation. Um, B, is it a priority in your jurisdiction? Um, and C, do you think that this should be a priority new or existing in your jurisdiction within the next five years, just to get a sense? If they weren't working on it now, would they in the future? And these reports are available on the website as well. So I managed to get, um, with some coercion, hopefully friendly coercion, um, a 70% response rate from the participating local governments, which I think is really good for a survey. And I really pushed for a high response rate so that it would be a fairly good um, reflection of what's happening on the ground. So in terms of um, uh, what I did is I, I pooled the top three responses to the question A, so uh, what is happening. And um, the most common response is the yellow bar, and it says nothing. Um, however, note that um, there was that was only representing one third of the responses. So um, the remaining two thirds were some of the top responses were that, that there was a policy added, that a partnership had formed, or there was some sort of initiative all related to that recommendation. And then you can see on the bottom, I I split it by the different regions. So there's Kootenays, Okanagan, Thompson, um, Thompson and Caribou actually, uh, the South Coast and Vancouver Island and then the North. Um, so you can see for the Kootenays, um, policies added were pretty high <clears throat> and partnerships um, uh, following that. So in terms of the summary of respondents for the um, sort of part B and C, do you think it's a priority now or do you think it's a priority in the future for that recommendation? Um, you'll see in general, except for in the Kootenays, but in general there is a slight increase for the next, um, for, for that recommendation becoming a priority in the future, uh, which shows on average uh, an 8% potential increase in local government seeing that recommendation as a uh, potentially emerging issue in their area. But yeah, the Kootenays, you guys are just steady, which is pretty good. <laughs> so in terms of um, moving on to the provincial government recommendations, so um, as I mentioned, there was 23 recommendations written by local governments for the province in that discussion paper. Um, and the good news is that the province has provided services for 17 of the 23 recommendations in three or more regions or ministries. So it's a slightly different um, approach for the survey for the province um, because it's just to one agency. You know, this is a lot a couple of different ministries for the province as a whole. Um, and I, what I would do is I, I went out to each of these Flynn, the Flynn Road, the Fourth Lands and Natural Reserve Operations Regional Offices, and I asked the folks that I, I work with there um, what, what, had, what had happened related to the recommendations, and um, they responded. So uh, I think that's quite, quite, a, quite a good uh, uh, turnout, um, considering the, the discussion paper was actually launched, I don't think I mentioned it, but it was launched in January 2011. So um, quite a lot of work has happened since then. Um, and also for the services, um, for the remaining six recommendations, um, there is definitely work happening, but there are more in the developmental stage. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples of what I was talking about. So for, the first, um, for the first key strategy, um, increasing local government awareness of CR, there's something called the Species and Ecosystem Information Portal. If you haven't seen it yet, I recommend you have a look. Just Google that, and um, you can have a search for all sorts of information. Um, secondly, um, th this is in terms of facilitating use of effective uh, tools and techniques. So what, what I did is I worked with UBCM, the Union, Union of British Columbia Municipalities, and we managed to get um, an award at their, at their convention in September um, for the innovative leadership category. Um, we managed to get an emphasis on biodiversity. Um, this was a, a couple of years ago, 2013. And um, it was really, it was quite a great experience. And the um, Tufino ended up, the municipality Tufino ended up winning. This is a picture of them on their um, mud flat. Another um, thing that the province has done related to the third key strategy, identifying and collaborating on shared responsibilities. Um, there have been a lot of uh, various uh, ideas um, and initiatives by different regional ops um, related to getting information out. 
Um, this one is an example of some species cards, ID cards that were prepared. Um, fourth, uh, conducting ecosystem mapping and encouraging data sharing. So hopefully you guys may have heard of um, IMAP in BC. So it's a great resource. Um, I mentioned that there's the species and ecosystem at risk explorer. Uh, you can mm. also search for uh, species um, and see their occurrences on the map. There's even a mobile version, which is the one I popped up here. Um, so if you're on your mobile device, you can use that app. Uh, in terms of the fifth key strategy, uh, engaging landowners in deer habitat protection, there's a great document which was updated in 2014 called Develop with Care. And it provides environmental, environmental guidelines for urban and rural land development in BC. And it's definitely worth a read. OK, so I just wanted to switch gears over to um, talking a little bit more about uh, balancing the triple bottom line, so the sort of economic, environmental, and social aspects of species and ecosystems at risk. Um, the picture of the lady there is Nancy Olawire, and she's from um, SFU, School of Public Policy. Um, and she provided uh, a plenary presentation at the last symposium we had in October 2013. So um, also related to the Species at Risk five-year plan, I led on a project called the SEER Incentive Project, which finished up uh, about a year ago. And what we did was um, we explored and recommended new ways, including incentives and possible project funding, to promote voluntary protection of species at risk. And um, as I mentioned, uh, it was a focus of the last symposium we had um, that Nancy spoke at. And we included 10 different case studies, um, uh, which actually included, included the Kidney Conservation Program's Local Conservation Fund. Um, and uh, there was yeah, a, a number of uh, great breakout sessions that talked about the case studies and other work that was happening. And it really helped us um, when we were developing our recommendations. So the group, um, the, the project consisted of these different ministries, um, environment, Monroe, agriculture, and community support and cultural development. And the external incentive working group consisted of all these other uh, agencies, including local government. And we had a representative from the local government working group as well. And there was academia, you can see the list. Um, it was really great to have a lot of great minds providing input. So at the end of the day, we left. Um, we, we came up with four of what we thought um, were the best um, key short to medium term recommendations to uh, start working on. So this is just the, this is the exploring phase. Um, we came up with a conservation tax incentive program, a SEER charter for the province. These are potential, remember. Uh, enhancing SEER priorities on private agricultural lands, as you remember on the initial geospatial analysis I mentioned um, near the beginning of the talk. Um, agricultural lands are quite, um, quite important for species and ecosystems at risk, and they represent 33% of private land in BC. And also potentially looking at the option of a legal agreement with private landowners. Um, Other questions coming? Early days. OK, sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you mid-sentence. Um, how did the five? Five-year plan consider or incorporate the work of land trusts. Um, so the five-year plan was about coming up with sort of what the province can do. Um, uh, obviously, working with partners, um, uh, but it was sort of in terms of you know, the, 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 the three key elements that I was mentioning earlier were related to gaps, sort of analyzing opportunities um, for and making, making recommendations. Um, uh, with regards to existing or new policy and legislation tools, uh, exploring and recommending new ways uh, for promoting voluntary protection of species at risk, and then developing options for uh, innovative and enduring funding. So really in terms of like land trust, those that falls into, in my opinion, more of the, the second option, which is sort of what we're talking about today. Um, land trusts have always been mentioned in terms of working with the local government working group. Um, there's a lot of work that happens between land trusts and local governments. So in terms of um, sort of what, what my work involves, um, we tend to uh, focus, um, I, I tend to focus on a high level, but we also encourage local governments um, to be working with land trusts on species and ecosystems at risk. Um, in terms of any sort of further work with land trusts, um, that's 
probably is a little further down the road. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? I don't see any right now. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the incentive project was sort of, yeah, coming up with these recommendations. And um, what I would like to focus on a little bit right now is something that um, is taking up a majority of my, my time related to these incentives, and it's the Species and Ecosystems at Risk Charter, the potential charter. So um, we, what, what happened is um, we had approval to continue working on this idea. Uh, and um, I really uh, believe it's important to uh, engage and bring in uh, external advice and um, expertise as much as possible. Uh, so I formed the SEER Charter Advisory Committee, which is made up of uh, the provincial government, YAM, and regional districts and municipalities. So there's um, three different ministries involved, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations, and um, Ministry of Community Sport and Cultural Development. And all these different uh, municipalities and regional districts um, sit on the group, including UBCM at the bottom here. So the purpose of this group, um, the advisory committee provides expert advice, particularly from the local government perspective, on what this potential SEER charter could look like. So the approach to date, uh, the group formed in September 2016. Uh, there's a, a number of smaller and larger municipalities and regional districts, and that is on purpose so that there's a variety of sizes of local governments from all over different parts of the province. Um, it, existing, it, it recognizes existing SEER work uh, and tries to create a positive and supported language. So just taking a step back, what I'm meaning by uh, a SEER charter would be um, potentially something that would be uh, written between the province and voluntary participating local governments. So um, what, what one thing I've heard a lot from local governments over the years is their desire um, and need for uh, delineation of roles and responsibilities with respect to species and ecosystems at risk in BC. So the idea behind this SEER charter would be to help do that um, and make sure people are on the same page. Uh, and then there's also hopefully some reference there, particularly for local government staff who are looking to try and provide advice and information for their senior management or elected officials. Uh, so we're hoping that this document would be that um, without any kind of a downloading ceiling um, or directive or shaming, nothing like that. It was that the intent is to try and provide um, that uh, sort of supported language um, and definitely help with uh, clarifying roles and responsibilities. So um, in terms of the members and the roles and responsibilities, um, uh, the provincial government is the main coordinator. Uh, we facilitate um, and develop and implement the potential SEER charter. Local governments participate on the advisory committee to provide strategic input and expert advice from their perspective. Uh, and UBCM um, represents the Environment Committee and Executive. They provide strategic input, expert advice, and assist in the communication of this potential peer charter to all of BC local governments. So in terms of what we've done to date, so as you could see from the list earlier, uh, we have participation from 10 municipalities and six regional districts. We've had three, possibly four, um, teleconferences. UBCM and the project teams, that's the provincial government folks, have had some additional calls as well. Uh, there are four draft versions, we're on version four, um, of the recommendations for the potential SEER charter. And um, the advisory committee, um, majority of folks were able to attend this, this uh, SEER symposium uh, on the 31st of January. And they were great in uh, facilitating uh, group table uh, breakout discussions um, at, at, at the symposium. And the breakout discussions talked specifically about the different sections in a draft, uh, the draft recommendations that the advisory committee put together. So I'll just, I'm not going to show you the whole, um, the whole draft because it's 
definitely a work in progress still, but I can just tell you what, um, what we're thinking that the headings are going to be. So section one is looking at recommending common understanding, the recommended common understanding mm -hmm. and goals. Uh, section two is looking at recommended support. Section three is looking at uh, recommended rules and actions. And four is looking at recommended additional pieces. So one thing that um, we look to other existing examples of province-wide charters in BC, and we probably all um, arrive at the same place we did, which is the Climate Action Charter. Um, this isn't going to be the same thing as that charter, but we can certainly learn um, from learn lessons from that approach. And the one thing that was really great is that there was a great online resource. So that would be something that we would definitely look at for this charter too. So the recommended additional pieces would be things like, what do you guys find helpful, and what would you like to see on a supported, uh, on a supporting uh, website? So we ask for information from that. So where we are right now is we got some really good feedback from the breakout sessions at the symposium, and um, the advisory committee and um, the provincial government team are working together right now to try and incorporate uh, the breakout session comments and uh, redraft again. So um, in summary, I just wanted to explain some of the stuff we're doing for SEER. Just a reminder, so we've got um, federal and provincial uh, work that happens. We have recovery planning, support for recovery planning in the province. We have a lot of initiatives happening under the species at risk five-year plan. And the local government working group is continuing to do lots of ongoing work. So thanks so much. I hope there's lots of questions. I've left a little bit of time. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. I, I don't have any new questions right now. If anybody has a okay. question, enter it into. Oh, there's one that came in. Great strategic overview. I'm curious where addressing invasive plant species is captured. Oh, yeah. And I have um, a whole bunch of my colleagues work specifically on invasive species. Um, so um, there's, there's a whole program for aquatic invasive species, which um, you probably have heard of. They've done a whole bunch of work, um, and they've got a bunch of boats being checked every year now. Um, and there's other work happening on terrestrial invasive species. So um, you can always email me, and I can provide you more information. Um, it is something that comes up through the local government working group as well, quite a bit. Um, and I know that there's chapters all over the province, so um, if local governments aren't aware of it, then um, we encourage them to contact them too. But um, I need to email you some further information if you ever asked. Great. Um, yep. the congratulations on the SEER charter work. Will this just be a guideline, or will it have enforcement clout? Um, yeah, you know, the stick and carrot approach, um, I, I always sort of um, feel like we, we need more sticks and we need more carrots. I don't think that the charter being a stick would, I think it would sort of um, deflate from the original intent of it. It was, it was to be very um, voluntary and supportive, not to hold over people's heads. Um, and it's a, it's a fine line to cross because we want, we want the charter to have enough substance to it. But we also want to not scare people off from voluntary signing on to it. So um, we don't, I don't think the, I think, you know, having, having the charter being an enforcement piece would sort of um, take away from the original intent. But yeah, we, we are aware that we probably need better sticks and carrots on each side as well. Another question, how do the local governments join the initiative? If you are a local government and you want to join the local government work group, mm. you email me and I will say welcome. <laughs> Everybody's welcome. Yeah. And if and you're an NGO that works closely with local governments, we can tend to, you know, I, I, I tend to make sure that the, um, the membership, the participation of local governments is focused mostly on local governments because it's supposed to be to promote um, uh, enhanced peer protection on local government lands and private lands. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, NGOs like Kootenai Conservation Program and others are very important. So we welcome uh, folks that work at a high strategic level um, that are working with local governments as well. So just con just contact me. And another question, are you working to engage municipalities and regional districts who are not participating in the SEER local working, government working group? Yes. 
I have this sort of, you know, manifest destiny approach. I would love to have every municipality and regional district in the province on board. We have all but one regional district, actually. Um, and we have, um, I can't remember, the last time I counted it was over 60 municipalities. I don't know the exact numbers, but um, uh, there's really no reason for them not to join. Sometimes it comes down to my capacity because sometimes I just cold call if I have a few extra minutes in the day. Um, I'll cold call, but if you all know someone who you think would be interested in this group, um, uh, please advertise and I'll add them to the email distribution list. When you're, when you're added, there's no obligation to, there's no command performances or anything. Um, <clears throat> I don't bombard people's emails, at least I try not to. So you don't get, you know, hope, you know, heaps and heaps of emails from me. Um, but you will get some information sent uh, through the e-distribution list. And um, I tend to try and have two teleconferences a year. We used to do it for the whole province, but obviously over 160 people doesn't work on a teleconference anymore. So we split it up to the six regions I mentioned. So the Kootenays, the Okanagan, the Thompson and Caribou, the South Coast, Vancouver Island, and the North, so that we're able to sort of have a, a smaller group conversation about what's happening. And it, it tends to be a lot about communications on who people are and what they're doing. That seems to be the number one uh, thing people want to hear. Great. Uh, there was a comment that they didn't, uh, that the city of Vernon wasn't on the list. So that might be one to follow up. Uh, okay. Yeah. Wanting to join and uh, make species at risk a priority. Um, next comment. As biologists, we are seeing the destruction of critical habitat and key species at risk habitat features on private land, despite efforts to communicate with landowners, Flynn Row, NGOs, other government. There seems to be little in the way of consequences to landowners that choose to destroy SAR habitat. COs and Flynn Row do not seem to have the mandate or capacity to deal with SAR on private land. Thoughts? Right, yeah. Um, well, the first thing that comes to mind if you're talking about actual identified habitat under SARA, there, there are repercussions if people are just damaging or destroying the critical habitat. And um, the case in Quebec of the Western Chorus Rog is a really good example that the federal government will come in on private land if need be. So, um, you know, if, if you don't know that case, I can send you information if you, if you can't find it online. Um, it, when it comes down to it, sometimes there's just not enough warm bodies on the ground, and I get it. Um, I think just the more that we can provide examples of cases like the Quebec case, the more people will start to realize that it is serious, that they're not meant, you know, they really, they're not allowed to do that. If it's habitat destruction or putting a species at risk in peril in some way, um, the survival and recovery of that species is, is serious. So um, the more I think awareness can help because it's a little bit easier than trying to get a whole bunch of people on the ground. So having things on your website, if, you, if you're if you a local government or a, or a land trust or an NGO, and making that information as widely available as possible, I think is just one more helpful step that we can do. It won't fix everything overnight necessarily, but um, I think uh, it can help. Um, there was a follow-up on the invasives, back to invasives. Sorry, is this considered within, within the innovative funding initiatives for habitats on private land? Um, the, like innovative, like, like in terms of local government planning, is, is that what you're meaning? Mm. I don't know. Brenda, if you want to send another note to clarify that, I, I assume it means the uh, the funding opportunities that you're you're looking for. Oh, right, could be. Um, I I don't I don't have the specifics at this point. Well, yes, the latter. Sorry. She said yes, the latter. Oh, now what was the yeah, I mean, I think it's part of the whole program. Um, so it, invasives is very much known. It's one of the top threats to a number of species at risk. So um, um, I'm, I'm assuming that everybody could use uh, you know, all the all the all the invasive um, initiatives happening could could use more funding, and um, uh, it would be part of that bigger picture. And a note that uh, people would definitely like the link to the species at risk case you were talking about in Quebec. So perhaps oh, you sure. can send me some follow-up email and we can distribute it to the folks who are on the webinar. Or yeah. we could put the right news. Uh, thanks for all this great information. On the graph you had with the gold and blue bars showing current and future priorities, you said the Kootenays looked steady, 
and I was thinking it looked flat. Since we're always looking for more ideas here, what are some of the future priorities other regions are looking at? Um, I mean, the first one I think of is your local conservation fund is amazing. Um, and a lot of people are looking to that. So you've actually, you know, you've got a, a leadership opportunity here. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, I, I know it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you have something that everybody's looking towards, um, that everything's PG in the Kootenays. So I'm sure that there's other things that we could work towards. Um, the Okanagan has a lot of very interesting work that they're doing. And in fact, they followed, you, you probably heard, they have um, the South Okanagan um, Conservation Fund that was just announced, um, which will happen this year. So that's really great. Um, if, if you're, I don't know if you're a local government or not, whoever was asking the question, but um, it, it's always surprising and great to hear um, on teleconferences that these face and that these face-to-face -face symposiums that we have the local government working group, all the stuff that's happening. Um, there's things in the planning world. It's, it's hard to know what where you're coming from, to how to answer that best, but there's there's lots of innovative planning ideas people are doing. Um, Marcy asked if she's the stewardship coordinator for the KCP, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, um, and and you guys probably work a lot um, on planning and things like that as well. Um, I think that there's, one thing that seems to resonate a lot with the local government working group is this whole, how do you communicate better so at the symposium, we brought in um, Rick Cool from the Royal Roads University and a couple of folks from um, Chris and Gavin from the uh, BC Royal Museum. And they came in with a different perspective and some ideas on how to sort of um, capture people's uh, imagination and thought and interest in species at risk, um, especially habitat protection and things. Um, and we heard from a couple of people in planning in local government um, Surrey and Kelowna, but there were some folks there that came to chat. Um, and they, they all said the same thing, is making sure you're really connecting with your audience, whoever your audience is, really identify them. And, and um, pictures mean more and stories mean more than dots on a map. So that was sort of a new thing that sort of I've heard of quite a lot lately. So I don't know if that's sort of what you were trying to hear, but, um, but I'm happy to chat with you offline more as well. And it's certainly a priority for the KCP to engage more with local governments. Absolutely. Yeah. A, a couple of uh, more comments, I think, or questions. How do you get the federal government to get involved right away, not after the habitat is destroyed? Um, and then another comment, racer uh, snake hibernaculus being destroyed on private agricultural land near trail as we speak. We need tools fast. Yeah, so you, yeah, um, my, my best and contact um, the closest federal government office. Um, so, you know, contact Canadian Wildlife Services or I don't know whoever your closest office would you be. You don't have much in the Kootenays. That's one of the gaps here. Yeah, there's one in the Okanagan though. Yes. Um, so you can contact them. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not federal government, so I'm not too sure what else to suggest really. But um, making sure if you have mapped data, um, making sure it's in the CDC, um, and just, yeah, trying to get that information out. Um, there are, I don't know if it's local government or not who was asking the question, but there there are tools available to local governments, you know, different um, planning tools and bylaws and things that you can use, and there's a really great resource if you haven't already seen it called the Green Bylaws Toolkit. Um, so there's a wealth of knowledge in there as well, um, and other local governments are usually a great resource. Um, if, if another local government's already done it, then piggybacking onto what they've done um, is really helpful. Lots of questions so coming in your comments in those last uh, few minutes here. I don't know about the 5% of BC being private land, 87% of species at risk on private land, islands and valley bottoms. That's a pretty stunning and inspiring statistic. Hope that gets used as a headliner for campaigns. Oh, it, yeah. That's a good reminder that I need to write that report up <laughs> in my in my spare time. Yeah, I was pretty surprised. Um, that information, I was surprised it wasn't already out, actually. So that's where I started to do the geospatial analysis. And um, there's a lot of caveats. Of course, it's just the known data that we have, which brings me to please ask everybody if you've got species data, 
um, if there's um, reports that come in related to develop, app development applications and things like that, please send them to the CDC because we're only as good as the data we have. But um, yeah, it's a good reminder. I'm going to try and get that information out. Mm -hmm. I've got a note to ask you for that slide because it would be effective in our presentations as well. Um, if peril to, to species at risk on private land is suspected, who can enter and assess and investigate? Um, yeah, they're, they're, again, the, the whole access on private lands and then making sure that whatever data you get, if you do get access on private lands, um, is is not sensitive. Like often, often there's sensitive information that's related to private lands, but um, if you're if you're talking about sort of access and inventory and stuff like that, the best place to contact is with CDC. And then there's a note, CDC does not accept observations on private land without landowner permission. Yeah, it's tricky. I don't know what else to say. <laughs> uh, another comment, cleared chat, yellow-breasted chat habitat has been cleared and destroyed in the last year, greater than six hectares with no attention from any federal, provincial, or other authorities. Really, there's a lot of a concern in the Kootenays about these activities. Uh, just a plug. Uh, from Pamela Zevitt, the coordinator of the South Coast Conservation Program, that SCCP has a well-developed local government regional district collaborative program for policy and private land issues around species at risk. We are happy to provide reflections and share resources on our work with other organizations who are just starting out on this road. And I know we only have three more minutes. Uh, Can I just make a quick comment about the chat? Mm -hmm. um, the the federal government is working on a pilot that's called FIRPAL, um, OLG is what it stands for, Species at Risk um, Partnership Agricultural Lands or something. Sorry, don't quote me on that. Um, yeah. But just Google that. Um, and the, the chat is one of the um, species that they're looking at. So you might want more information because it relates to the agricultural land and that species. You might want to check that out. Yes. Um, here's a note uh, from an RDK staff. Access could be granted to weed control officers as appointed by local boards. So that would be uh, weed control officers. Western screech owl may get destroyed in a couple of months if it's not stopped in Vernon. So clearly a lot of concern and it leads us to say that this is clearly a relevant and important topic and I'm so glad that you were able to speak to it today, Lynn. I know it's not a lot of time and uh, potentially we could look at hosting one of these to your working group um, information sessions or meetings in the Kootenays at some point and uh, better engaging yeah. the local governments and, and supporting them. So with that, uh, unless there's any last questions floating in, I think we're at our time to wrap up. Okay. No other questions. So thank you very much for your time, Lynn, and thank you to all of you who were able to participate in the webinar today. We're hoping to send out a uh, survey uh, to all webinar participants in the winter webinar series to ask you how it went for you and what kind of topics you'd be interested in in the future. Thank you so much everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.